I'm Mr. Bolden. We're here with our very first classroom series. Uh, this is an idea that our students last year dreamt up that we would invite some musicians that are in the industry and actors and bring them here to our classroom where we're filming and invite them on television to learn a little bit about their lives. And today we have uh, who I think is just a great start to our show. Uh, we have a gentleman coming all the way from San Francisco, grew up in Boston. His name is Jonah Matranga, and without further ado, I'm going to welcome out to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together, Mr. Jonah Matranga. <laughs> welcome, sir. Thanks. Hey, everybody. So, Jonah, you, uh, you performed here last night at McCain. Tell me what it's like. Uh, one of the things that we see behind us is the set that the kids here built. Yeah. That really chronicles a lot of your life. Yeah. And so I thought maybe we could start off, maybe tell us what we're seeing, and then we'll start into your book here. All right. Uh, so first of all, I was completely blown away. This is literally the fanciest thing I've ever played in front of in my life, so way to be. Uh, secondly, so all right, you're all listening in your nun. That's a line from a tune of mine about growing up, about all the pressure we put on ourselves growing up. And Work for Love is a recent tune I put out about... Uh, yeah, about just not stuff. doing what you don't want to do. Oh, stuff. <laughs> stuff. I'm going to be good. Uh, yeah, record cover, book cover, a couple more record covers. First band, Far. Uh, solo record I put out of my house in 1999. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of album covers. This heart question mark thing is something I've been drawn from my whole life. It's kind of, I love curiosity. I love ideas. I love mystery, something like that. Um, Ideas is a, is a thing I started where I, I uh, keep in touch with people regularly and kind of release songs in a more personal way and more communal way because I'm more interested in the, in the conversation part of this than in the industry part of it. Um, yeah, and someone put a lyric, actually, that's not even a lyric I wrote. My buddy wrote that, but I covered his song. <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm going to send that to him because he's going to be psyched too. I saw you take a photo of that last yeah, yeah. night. Yeah, I'm sending that to Kev. So speaking about the social commentary, I can't help but look at the shirt oh, that right, you're wearing. Oh, right, yeah, on purpose, yeah. So, yeah, so um, a white Jewish male yeah. that's in the music industry that's uh -huh. wearing a Black Lives Matter shirt. Uh -huh. Tell me about, uh, with your social commentary and your music, why that means so much to you. I mean, mostly because, you know, anyone who knows numbers knows that white men voted overwhelmingly for Trump. <laughs> And that means white men overwhelmingly voted for white supremacy. And I would rather not be another white dude that is on that train. Um, like I was talking about last night, we were born into this. I was born into this. I'm not ashamed of being who I am. I will be ashamed if I leave this world not having done even a little bit to dismantle and to clap back against the status quo, which right now, is, uh, is indeed a world where we need to say that black lives matter because statistically they seem to matter less, and that sucks. Sure, and actually uh, here in Wilmington, Delaware, uh, one of the things we are unfortunately written up for in the newspaper is the fact that uh, Wilmington is the deadliest teenager, or deadliest city to grow up a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts about, you know, our young people that are out here listening, the world that, that they're living in, and here in our own city in Wilmington, you know, what can you offer to them as a musician, do you think, through music, and? How have you tried to use that as a platform to raise them up? Well, I mean, every, every community I've ever been in, the more things they have like this, the more things they have, the creative outlets they have, the more all ages places they have to gather, the more resources people have and young people have to just hang out, uh, the less they're being a little crazy kid like I was growing up and getting into trouble and vandalism and everything else. And um, and as far as violence and, and really heavy duty violence, that's a thing that a lot of, it's funny, a lot of white supremacists and white supremacist sympathizers will, will point to, oh, what about, what about the crime, the inner city crime, the da 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 da? And that's a part of white supremacy too, and that's a part of systemic racism too, because when you take away resources for generations and when you hurt and torture and do everything else that's been done for generations, you're gonna get violence. It's not a, it's not a difficult math equation. So I guess in my music and in my, just in my life, because um, I don't really see much of a difference between me as an artist and me as a human. Right. So, but music does have a power to give us an outlet. It's certainly given me an outlet to kind of deal with some feelings and, and work stuff <laughs> for myself, stuff. 
We'll beep that out in the uh, right. process. <laughs> <laughs> He's used to being on stage, and <laughs> I've heard you many times. You just kind of speak your mind. Boston. That's okay. We're, we're happy to get the real Jonah here, so I'm, I'm cool with that. So Jonah just wrote a book. It's called Alone Rewinding, 23 Years of Fatherhood and Music. And so I got, I wouldn't call it an advanced copy, but you've prioritized my release sure. out to me, so I really appreciate that. <laughs> so I got to read this before many people, and I felt... I was really just sending them desperately and quickly, and he, ha he was... Yeah, honest, I, yeah. I, I'm just going to tell everybody I got an advanced <laughs> copy. Oh, um, no, I'm kidding. So one of the things you just talked about, you were really into vandalism, and I think that you opened up your <laughs> book uh, with the typical rock star mentality of what we would expect from somebody who's in the industry. You open it up where your life was one of drugs. You open it up with one where maybe your self-worth as a high schooler. You felt I, the particular line that hit, hit me the most was, uh, I heard most things as veiled insults back then, not knowing neck, what was next uh, scared me. Which tells me that you were dealing with some insecurities being a high schooler, which I think most of our kids can. Um, but it's much more complex than that. Because I read about your father in here. I read about being offered alcohol at the age of four, and I think to myself, you survived. Mm. You know, and our kids here can survive too. Mm -hmm. and I think that's a great message in all this. And so I just wanted to maybe talk about how have you overcome the adversity that you talk about with your opening chapter here? What are some of the things, how has music led you in writing this book? Well, yeah, so adolescence, it seems like it's, it, it's a crazy time for just about everyone, that, that seems true. And uh, early childhood chaos and early childhood poverty, I mean, there's millions of studies on it. Um, it creates a different level of insecurity and a different level of fear. And so there's sort of, yeah, I, I, I just kind of want to clarify, like, yes, I made it through. And, and my early childhood was, was a lot. And I was also a little white boy in America. so. It, it is a different level of survival, sure. you know, and there's, uh, there's sort of different things to talk about with that. And, yeah, I mean, a uh, playwright called David Mamet once said, no one with a happy childhood ever went into the theater. And so we're back to music and, and art being a way to, to help me survive. And I, I'm not sure without music and without some resources around that that I would have made it through high school. I was on probation, and, um, yeah, if it weren't for so, a couple of really cool teachers and programs... Uh, I'm pretty sure I would not be here. So it's no exaggeration to say that art and that kind of community kind of saved my life, so yeah. Sure, uh, and I, I saw too, you know, I was waiting for like this big, how you got sober. I was waiting All for right. this big reveal, and then I think you, the quote was something in November of 1986. Mm -hmm. It just happened. Yeah. But one of the things I thought was really interesting, you, you talk about it happened and you felt clear, like there's a clarity to what was going on in your life. What was that like to have a fog lifted, you know, and to, to start experiencing things in a different way? Uh, it, was, it was painful, it was uncomfortable. I mean, the whole thing about addiction, as far as I can tell, and, and drugs is that it's not, there's a woman called Pima Chodron, she's a Buddhist woman, and she, she said, forget about all the moral stuff about drugs and da da da, all the lecturing. They're just kind of a babysitter to, to get you through whatever moment you're in. And, and, and addiction is medicating something. And so when, when the medication's taken away, well then the pain comes back. Um, and then the pain has to be dealt with. So it wasn't super fun getting my feelings back, honestly, and, and, and during adolescence and figuring all this stuff out that I was going through. And it was nice to, yeah, to kind of be present with it and check it out and um, move through the discomfort pretty well, yeah. So then after that, uh, you kind of moved into the book, you talked about uh, the Banditos, uh, right. going through sure. your, uh, I would say, if anybody ever watched the show Jackass on MTV, when you painted the picture for that, uh, that's kind of what I pictured, it was your crew uh, doing the MTV type stunts, but without the cameras. That's kind of what the- Yeah, and I mean, and the Banditos, I mean, that was, that was when we were, so we would, so what he's referring to is, when we were, when I was maybe nine or 10, we'd go into convenience stores with little bandanas around our faces, and, um, and uh, I don't think we had fake guns or anything like that, but we'd, we'd run in. Well, back in the day, it was a different thing. It was, it was strange. So, so we'd run in, and we'd, we'd say, this is a stick up, and it was like, you know, a bunch of little 10-year-olds, but then we would literally start grabbing everything we could stuff in our pockets and run. 
And by the time they figured out that we weren't joking, we were we were gone. So we <laughs> we were these little local just ne'er do wells, yeah. And so I couldn't help but think with what you stated before. Do you think your childhood would have been able to do the exact same thing if you were not a white man? No, that's all thing. I mean, it's I, I when I got busted and was in court. It wasn't lost on me. I looked around. We we were poor, but we had a family friend who was a well-connected lawyer, and so he was able to protect me in court and keep me out of juvie um, and get my record sealed. And as I'm walking out of court, I see a lot of black and brown kids there who did not look like they had a family friend that was a lawyer, and they looked scared. And I didn't know what was going on with them or what they had done. But their consequence, probably for the very same things that I was doing, was inevitably worse because they didn't have the resources to keep them out of the system. Yeah. Um, so from a music standpoint, one of my favorite songs, which I never knew where it came from, but was Hostage. And I'll never forget the first time I actually saw you play and I heard the line, falling up a flight of stairs. And I just thought to myself, that's one of the most poetic lines I've ever heard in music. And even the performance of it was creepy and eerie in the way the falsetto goes up. Mm -hmm. um, but what I didn't know was how tied up to the, your father that was. I didn't know any of your background. And uh, a lot of times in school, in life, we never know what somebody else is going through. Yeah. But uh, looking through your music through the lens of your book, it really helps personalize and remind us of being present. Um, yeah. But what's it like to play a song that would remind you of that night after night as well? Well, that's, that's my kind of therapy. I okay. mean, that's the thing, is that for me, when I'm able to write down what I've been through, it helps make it not so massive. And I get to revisit it on my own terms. And I, and I get to, to have community around it and have other people go, hey, that spoke right. to me. And I think the more we're able to speak to each other honestly about what we've been through and hear each other and show up for that, I think that's one, I mean, if there's more of that, you know, it, there's a lot of sort of made, fun made of, of being vulnerable and of 12-step and about community and about talking to each other um, and sharing our feelings, especially among men. It's this kind of stoic, tough thing where you're not supposed to, and it just hurts us. It just, uh, patriarchy is just as bad as white supremacy and, and, and the stoicism that men are supposed to have and not share their feelings and not talk about that stuff. It literally kills us, and, and we do most of the raping and murdering too, so you know, there's that to figure out, yeah. So speaking of uh, that, so one of your songs I think in many ways saved my life. And I got to tell you this a little bit uh, through an instant message a while back. Uh, but you had a song called Tides. Mm. And uh, there's a line in it, this time next year I won't be here, I'll be somewhere anywhere but here. And uh, I was in my own place in my life I listened to those words, and I still remember, you know, talk about being vulnerable, you know, male. I remember, you know, crying my eyes out. Sure. Listening to that song asleep and, you know, going That's to bed. That's what music can do. Yeah, it's, it's one of those healing things. And then the next day I woke up and I was like, you know what, I'm going to go get another job. Nice. It really just changed my perspective. No, I'm, I'm going to leave here. Uh -huh. But then I saw in the book what it was about. And uh -huh. I thought, wow. Uh, so you had just found out that... Um, Basically, to put it kind of more crassly, you knocked up your girlfriend, right? right? Yeah, break and up so, sex. Yeah, break up sex, and uh, you were going to be a father. Now, how old were you when you get this news? 24. 24 years old. Mm -hmm. 24 years old, and the band had just started out yep. uh, at this point. So uh, Jonah is playing in a band called Far. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys are signed at this point? Not yet. Okay, so you're just kind of, you know, uh, road warriors. Living this in together. Sacramento, trying to be a local band, trying to figure it out, yeah. And trying to get signed, Yeah. right? And so tell me about what that's like to find out you have such a life-changing experience about to happen, and you don't even know who you are at this point. You don't know who your band is or what you're doing for a living. I'm a father. I know it has to be scary. Yeah, I mean, I didn't even know what I was feeling. Um, I, I was a late bloomer already. I had been a total wreck through my teens and kind of gotten it together through college, but was just kind of pissed off at the world and was just kind of getting my footing in Sacramento and, and learning how to do anything. Uh, and yeah, it was my first real relationship. And so finding out that she was pregnant and figuring out what to do with that, I was still, I still out and even, my dad was, was basically homeless living in Florida. I hadn't seen him in about 15 years and he was in and out of jail and stuff. And so I was still, still just 
barely trying to figure out my feelings for him and for that and was I going to go see him and what was that all about and then all of a sudden I'm going to be a dad and um, yeah it was it was a it was a ridiculously confusing time and so that song Tides he's talking about that this time next year I won't be here that was just me saying all right something's going to change and I don't know what's coming next but my choice right now is whether I'm going to be scared about it or be curious about it and I think that's the only choice that we get because obviously the future is just a hallucination we don't know what's going to happen really so the only choice is am I going to be excited about this am I going to be curious about it or am I going to be scared of what's coming next and I was trying to get over that fear of always waiting for the next punch to come and so Hannah's born mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I actually think that I might have met your daughter at Salisbury at one point you brought her to a show yeah. and she was like yeah. 10 years old or uh -huh. so uh -huh. um, she's born occasionally she goes out on the road with you throughout your career but uh -huh. there's a lot of turmoil as well because you can read the pain sure in, in what you wrote yeah. um, so I got to ask when my Ch first child was born, I remember looking at her going, I've never loved something as much as I love this child. Yeah. And you know, I almost feel guilty because like, up until then, it's my wife. And then I'm going, OK, well, now yeah. it's my child. Yeah. Um, did having your own child change the perception of your parents? Hmm. Yeah, to some degree. I think, I think being a dad, it gave me more empathy for my parents and for other parents kind of struggling. I remember the, the, a time when I got upset with Hannah and I felt a lot of empathy for anyone who's ever hit their kids or something because I couldn't imagine the kind of shame that must produce and I felt so grateful that I wasn't strung out then or drinking then or otherwise sort of had less resources because I probably would have done something like that and I don't know how you come back from that and that's how the shame and addiction cycle starts is that kind of guilty feeling guilty thing and then doing terrible stuff to kind of confirm my fears that I'm a terrible person so yeah I've had a lot of empathy for other parents and it actually it let me feel some anger for my parents because I, I saw her growing up when I kind of held it together and had a community and didn't leave and didn't freak out the way my folks did in a lot of ways and she has grown up without a lot of the fear and a lot of the scars that I've got so in some ways it helped me kind of go and go to my mom and be like, hey, you did not show up. Like, you stuck around after dad left and that's great. And in this and this and this and this way, you didn't take care of yourself. And that got on to me and Kayla. So it was, I was able to hold my mom more accountable in a, in a more mature way. And yeah, it also just made me realize, wow, there's a lot of fear going on here and, and their childhoods were their childhoods and I think maybe evolution works like if I can be a little bit better of a parent to my kid than my parents were to me and maybe you know if we all can kind of move the ball along and not go backwards and I raise guess that's the thing. Up. Yeah, raise each other up. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I, one of the things that I think is a kind of a conundrum uh, or paradox is we're told to respect our parents and you know every single person in this room at some point in time has been told you know well you need to respect your elders or you know respect mom and dad but that doesn't mean that our parents are perfect. No. Uh, and that's one of the greatest illusions that as a child you have to come to accept. Yeah. The love of a parent despite all the imperfections. And I think that's actually the greatest thing we have to have with each other in relationships. Is yeah. that none of us are perfect and we've got to accept each other's imperfections. Yeah, I think respect is one of those words that can be wielded by dominant culture and it really means fear me. It doesn't mean respect right. me. If, if respect our parents meant more like, hey, respect the fact that they're human too and that they've gone through a mess too and that you have no idea what they've gone through ask them to tell you I mean I think that's respecting them and respecting them with emotional intelligence is and sort of telling what you've learned about whatever you're going through that's respect um, blind obedience uh, I don't, I'm not sure that's right. respect and I think that's what a lot of authority figures mean when they say respect and therefore kids don't want to do that because right. I don't want to do that still well, I was going to take a quick little break if you want to play a song. I'm not sure if there's anything that you might, out of our conversation, think to yourself, hey, this might be a good thing to play right now. Let's make sure we got sound. Cool. Cool. There we go. Bye. 
So I'm sure some of the kids want to get into some of the really cool yeah, yeah, stuff, yeah. too. I, I just you wanted know? to talk to you. Yeah, so I figured a couple things that uh, I wanted to kind of get into. So the book then moves on from a lot of setting up where you came. So you got to read the book, the experience, all that. I'm not going to ruin the book. Uh, but then he gets into playing with the bands, playing with FAR, playing with New End Original, playing with Gratitude, and your own solo career, one-line drawing, and just being Jonah Matranga. Mm -hmm. And so... I guess one of the questions that the kids would probably have, and then we'll pass the mic because I'm really curious what they're going to say and what they want to ask you. All right. um, what is it like to play something? You played Coachella, right? Right. What's it like to play in front of that many people and to reach that part with your band? Have your song all over MTV, Xbox 360, I think, released with your song on it, uh -huh. um, which is a big deal. Microsoft uh -huh. purchased the rights. Sure. What's it like to start a career, have such like a purist, I mean, all your music I've ever experienced has a very pure heart uh -huh. to the lyrics. Uh -huh. What's it like to hit that peak and then go the next day or a couple days later back to doing solo stuff and then back on to the stage? Because you kind of swapped back and forth in mm -hmm. that time period. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I was just like a lot of kids looking, again, looking for that outlet, looking for that, that kind of release in music and, and just kind of freaking out with my friends. And 
I, it seemed like a lot of other people kind of drifted off into different hobbies or different pursuits or tried to do something more constructive and that might lead to a better career or whatever. And I just kept, I kept sticking with music. So it wasn't some, some deeply held dream to be a star. But I didn't really know what a life in music even looked like. So frankly, my whole life has been, as an artist, has been figuring out what I don't want to do more than what I do want to do. And, and so, you know, you talk about the Xbox and the big stages and all that stuff. And, and that's been interesting and it's helped me raise my kid and, um, and I'm grateful for it. And all I've learned over the years is that music a life in music, the music industry, a music career, all that stuff, when the fun goes out of that, it's actually a really sad, boring, kind of crappy life. Um, there's a lot of loneliness, there's um, a lot of decadence, uh, a lot, of, you know, and not the fun kind. Um, there's, yeah, I mean, well, Harvey Weinstein's in the news, you know, for assaulting a bunch of actresses. Uh, uh, you know, and, and is one of the biggest guys in the entertainment industry, and he's obviously a really broken dude, and he's done a lot of harm, and um, and we just lost Chris Cornell, and we just lost Chester Bennington, um, and they took their own lives, and, and that's a different kind of pain, and whatever they got going on, and hey, what's up? Um, and that, that kind of, whatever issues any of those dudes have had the industry part of this stuff, the money part, the pressure part. I know that's part of it because I know a lot of people that have had a lot more success than me that aren't nearly as happy as I am doing what I'm doing. So what I learned was that actually the big stages were fun and interesting, but I'll take a high school auditorium or a house or a record store or anything any time over that, and I don't care if I'm on another magazine cover as long as I'm getting to have conversations with people that are of substance, because the only two things that are true right now for sure, like we're all hanging out and we're all gonna die, and, and that's, that's kind of my simple axiom, and so whenever I'm in a situation, I'm, I'm thinking, hey, if I'm gonna die and I have no idea when and I have no control of that, like the one thing I do have control over is what I'm doing right, right now. And there's a smart dude called Eckhart Tilla who said, you got two choices when you're in a situation you don't like. One is change your situation and two is accept it entirely. And so in my music career, I've kept that on my mind. And if I'm in a place I don't enjoy being or I just kind of feel that uh, just uneasy feeling, I get out and I figure out another way to do it. And that's what's kind of led me here. Um, I could have been you know, richer and I could have been a lot more things and I'm pretty convinced that I wouldn't be as happy as I am sitting here talking with y'all um, and and I would yeah I, I would love to hear anything I was talking to someone last night uh, the kids that were hanging out after the show and saying again we're all hanging out now and we're all gonna die so let's have some real talk now go ahead okay yeah yeah um, compared to when you first started um, your music career as to now, how do you think you changed yourself as a person? Uh, I'm a lot less ambitious. Um, I'm a lot less chasing or competing for, for some money or stature or whatever. I'm more interested in, in this part, in the conversation part, and that I get to be at a high school right now talking with someone, asking a question like that. Yeah, I think that's a central difference. When some when a fan comes up to you and says that like one of your songs have like really touched them, how how does that make you feel? Uh, well, I'm a kid who grew up, you know, listening to records in in low light and reading the lyrics and stuff, and and getting when I love music, I really really fall in love with it. So when people come up to me w with questions and sentiments like that, um, I don't get a big head about it. I just realize that they're experiencing my music the way I've experienced a lot of other people's music. And I'm actually just psyched to be part of that, that chain of kind of passing that on, of whatever that magic thing is that music gives, that kind of company when no human being feels like good company. And I'm grateful to be that for anyone. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty sweet feeling. Sincerity never gets old. Um, 
when was like the first time that you ever drew like your heart symbol, like your heart question mark? Like when was that? Ooh, yeah, cool. yeah. I literally don't remember. I've I've tried to trace it back. The earliest image I've found of it is my early twenties, but I'm pretty sure I was drawing it a long time before then. I think before I started playing music a lot, uh, I, I loved drawing um, and. I just love playing with shapes, and so I think those two shapes, and when I realized they interlocked, I just thought it was a, a real neat thing, these two symbols that are used all the time in our culture and maybe overused. Um, so I don't know, and, and I, 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 if someone could ever point it out, I hope my mom comes up with some weird little drawing where like, I scrawled, like, look at this cool idea, because I don't know. So I gotta, I gotta follow up with that. Yeah, yeah. So, urban legends. There's been lots of urban legends about your career. One of them was, clarified in the book, it was that uh, you were offered a million dollars oh, right, right. for your song uh, to be in a Coca-Cola ad, which the book clarifies. I won't go into that. Read the book if you want the info. Sure. Uh, but there was also an urban legend, and I won't mention the artist, mm. that there was a lawsuit over the use with a famous artist of your logo. Oh, is that tr Okay, it is oh, true. Yeah. I didn't oh, want yeah, to say it out loud. Yeah. No, no, that's real, yeah. Uh, no, yeah, someone called me up. Um, after Jayla was on Saturday Night Live a bunch of years back saying that she had the, the heart question mark logo all over her set. And so uh, Chris, actually, the drummer for Far, he became a lawyer after Far broke up. And so I called him up and I said, hey, so this happened. I don't really know what to do about it, but I'd rather not have this image that's on my body and sort of that I've used my whole life uh, be co-opted by Jayla. And so we wrote to her lawyers. I really didn't know how it was going to go. But the coolest thing that came of it was that I asked people to send in um, album covers, T-shirts, stuff they had, because I had to have that for the trademark to kind of prove that I'd been using this and for a long time. And, and so all these people sent in their tattoos and sent in places they'd drawn it in the world and pl ways they had it in their lives. And, and it actually turned into this amazing thing of a reminder of, again, how a song or an idea of any sort can get into someone's life and mean something to them, and I don't have to be around. It's, 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 they have their own relationship with it. So that potentially strange situation uh, turned out to be a great thing, and JLo stopped using it. So um, you're welcome. Nice. <laughs> Other questions? Sorry. I just wanted to follow because I've heard, That's heard great. that. That's great. Over here, I think, uh, Caleb? Or is there one over here? Go ahead. Um, how do you think your career has changed your daughter's life? Yeah. When I would be, uh, when I'd be going away on tour and she'd say, I know you have to go away for work, you know, she was real little, you know, five or something like that, and she'd be sad and I'd be sad and she said, I know you have to go away, and I'd say very specifically, I do not have to go away right now. I'm choosing to go away. I'm going to miss you. I hate going away. And I love this a lot, and it's the best thing I figured out how to do what I love and make a living and help raise you. So, yeah, one of my biggest fears about being a musician and one of the things that shaped my career is my relationship with her because if I'm going to go away from her and I'm going to miss her, it can't just be a commercial. It can't just be a business transaction. That's not worth it. It has to be something this cool. It has to be something where I'm talking to other people and doing something that I feel really proud of in the world. And so I hope that having those conversations with me has given her a sense of, of the consequence of choice, that for every choice you have, you're, you know, for every place you go, you're leaving another place, you're leaving another person. And, but I worry all the time that my going away um, has scarred her in different ways, and I was really scared I was gonna turn out like my dad and not be around for her. And then one time when, I was, uh, when she was in high school, she asked me, how come you never tried harder to be famous? Uh, and I think what she meant is like, how come we don't have as much, much money as my friends? And, and I just said, I, I just, I wouldn't have been at your soccer games then. And, and that was more important to me than going out and chasing the brass ring. So I think, I think it was disorienting for her for me to go away. I wasn't a traditional dad by any stretch of the imagination. And I think it gave her a sense of, of that she gets to do what she wants and she gets to figure out what she loves and, and go for it in whatever way that works out. And obviously I hope the positives have outweighed the negatives. But that's a really sweet question. Thank you. Uh, Caleb, over here in the center. 
I got uh, two questions. One question is, um, what does your logo mean, and uh, what made you start writing music? What? Did you hear that? First part? I said, what does your logo mean? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the first thing that I thought it meant when, when I was sort of, when I was thinking about such things was, are you brave enough to love? And I don't necessarily mean that in a romantic sense. I mean more, are you brave enough to look at this, this horrifying, in a lot of ways, world that people have created with all this injustice and all this inequity and all this violence? And, and are you brave enough to look at that and, and show up with joy and with love? Um, and uh, when I got into existentialism in high school, actually, I think a lot of people think of that as very depressing. And for me, it was very liberating um, to kind of look into the abyss and come out with some joy. So that was kind of what it started being about. And these days, I think it's mostly, um, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much an atheist in the sense that I don't think this story, I haven't heard a story about God that I think is true. And yet, um, here I am with my heart beating and my blood going, and I'm not in control of that, and I could be dead at any second, and I wouldn't be in control of that. And so that kind of humility and so for me, God is kind of, it's love plus mystery. Um, and so this is, in a lot of ways, at this point, it kind of is me trying to, trying to talk about that. Um, and as for the, you know, when I started writing music, I mean, I remember being in the sixth grade talent show. Um, and uh, again, I think I was like a lot of little kids just kind of playing guitar and grade school and trying to figure out what it was. But when my friends kind of took guitar lessons and kind of started getting really like, you know, Eddie Van Halen good and all that stuff, I just was in my room writing songs. That's all I wanted to do was figure out how to get out all these thoughts and feelings that I had going on. And so songwriting became this real important thing for me. So I was writing songs a lot younger than any of my friends were because um, they were all practicing to get good at their instruments, which I'm not particularly good at my instrument. And I love songs, and I've written a lot of them. So I probably wrote my first tune when I was in like sixth or seventh grade, and um, that for me is really when I started actually playing music. I hear a corner, a yeah. voice in the corner, yeah? Lights are really bright. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, going to the center there then. Go. Okay, cool. Oh, how did you know what you wanted to write about? Yeah, I, I didn't and I still don't. Um, every time I've tried to write a song about something, it's, it's a song that has not lasted and hasn't given me much satisfaction. Um, it's more when I hear a phrase or I wake up with an idea. I think the most exciting part of this whole life for me is just the feeling of getting an idea and not knowing what that idea is. Um, and I talk in the book about that it's like seeing an animal that I don't quite recognize and I kind of follow it around and try and identify it and try and kind of get to know it and let it get to know me. And that's what it feels like for me to have an idea. So I don't, um, I really, I try to not try to write about anything. I try to just kind of let it come through and, and then see what happens later. Some tunes I've written that mean a lot to me, I still couldn't tell you exactly what they mean. I just know that it chokes me up to sing them. And, and that's my, kind of my little, my little, that's the signpost I follow, is it's, the feeling of it. And some of our students that are sitting here now um, are seniors in high school. They're writing college essays. And I know from talking to them, they're stuck. Yeah. They said, Mr. Bolton, I have no idea what to write about. And so I just told them, I said, you know, just start writing words on paper. Just let it flow. But I don't know. What, you're a songwriter, and what advice would you give about someone who's stuck on Tell your write? story. Just say, say what happened. The book taught me a lot about this, actually, because I wanted to write all this fancy da-da-da-da-da. And then I just thought, no, I'm just going to write what I remember. So my, I remember my college essays. One of them was on uh, this, this Outward Bound thing. Some people sent me on a trip with some other kids in trouble to try and sort me out. And I wrote about that trip. And uh, I was also a door-to-door -door kind of... Um, environmental activist working for a thing called Massburg that was uh, talking about toxic waste in Massachusetts and that it was giving little kids cancer and stuff. And 
So I just kind of wrote about what was going on for me. It didn't have to be some fancy thing. I think if you tell the truth about your life and you're real about it, uh, it's going to resonate with someone. Um, I think the truth never gets old. I think sincerity never gets old. Um, and so all I can say is if you tell your truth, I, I think it's going to work out. It might not um, always be the most popular thing in the room. And I think in the long run, it's a way better choice than trying to cover up and write something fancy. Who are your favorite uh, hip-hop artists? Ah. I mean, these days, so I, you know, so I'm an 80s kid, so Nation of Millions uh, is the best hip-hop record of all time as far as I'm concerned. So I think, I think Public Enemy and BDP were kind of my, uh, they're my early real heroes, and those, those uh, Edutainment by BDP and Nation of Millions, probably my two all time. Um, these days, I think the, the, the main heir to that kind of hip hop, and by that kind, I mean like sonically intense, amazing hip hop that also is, is thoughtful and not lowest common denominator. Um, I think Kendrick is, is the guy right now. I mean, I don't think there's anyone better than him. Um, yeah, he's the one that comes to mind these days. He's, he's the one that, that I think is, is on the most uh, sort of, he, he just, between his last two records, I don't think anyone's put out a one-two punch of hit in hip-hop in a long time. It's been that good, so, yeah. Right, so we had our last question down here in the uh, front. Looking back at your past life and being on tour and all that now, like, do you think that you would ever make it in your past life without writing music? I mean, obviously, you just never know. Maybe I could have found something else. But when I look back on some different junctures of my life, it is hard to imagine something other than music that, that would have given me the validation that I needed, sort of other people saying, hey, that was good. I mean, that, that was incredibly important for me to hear and not in an ego way, more in a survival way, more in like an I'm okay way, I'm not a total freak way, um, someone else feels the same things I feel way. Um, that, Music is really special for that. And then just this strange, when I'm singing, when you sing, you're literally shaking yourself up, the vibrations of singing, just as a physical exercise when you're rapping, when you're doing anything, when you're hitting a guitar, when you're hitting a drum. It's a physical thing. And I think that was important for me too because I can get real caught up in my brain sometimes and kind of lost in there. And so it's good to move and scream and jump and hit. Um, and not be hitting someone or you know, breaking a window or lighting a fire. So, nah, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I would have made it. Um, and I've talked to a lot of people over the years that, that feel the same way, that it's hard to imagine life, life without music. Yeah, good question. Excellent, so you end your book. Well, uh, I wanna say one more thing oh, yeah, though. Go ahead. I don't care if it's music, actually. Music's cool and I love music, but there's something. There's, it, it was music for me, but for someone else, it might be, might be photography, it might be writing a play, it might be being a plumber. Like, it doesn't matter. If there's something calling to you, I don't think it's about a guitar or a voice or that music's so cool. It's about a place that you feel safe. Because for me, I didn't feel safe around people. I still don't feel safe around people, largely. Music was my friend. And I, a lot of people that I know who don't do music but do what they love, they described the same feelings that I had when they were young about doing this thing. So I would just say, trust whatever you feel safe doing, whatever feels good, whatever lets you sleep, um, whatever gets you up in the morning. So yes, for me it's music, and I love that question, and for other people it's a lot of different stuff. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Um, so we live in really strange times. Yeah. Uh, I personally hate social media, but I use it every day. Yeah. Uh, I find that more and more teenagers, adults, are living in anxiety. Yeah. Um, you read the headlines every day, and it's a new headline that seems like the world's ending. Mm. But yet you choose to end your book with a message of hope. Mm. And for you, it becomes, uh, if you don't mind, I'll just read out of sure. the, the very last part here. Yeah. I'm starting to rethink the idea of hope. It's maybe the one word I've wrestled with most in my life. 
I've thought of it for a long time as being inherently tied to fear. I've been around some desperate, wishful thinking hope, the kind that maybe secretly yearns for disappointment and often gets it. And I know it's sunk into me some. I'm starting to feel the word with more curiosity, though. The more I can get in, it into my head that I really don't know what will happen next, the more possible anything feels. So in a world of so much uncertainty for our teens, for ourselves, where does Jonah go next? Hmm. Where's your hope? That's the whole thing. I have no idea. I mean, and right now is a perfect example of that. I mean, I'm, I'm 48, turned 48 this summer. My kid's grown up. She turned 23. Um, I, in a lot of ways, rock and roll is a young person's game. I'm not uh, as marketable as I was. And, and, I, and I'm less and less interested in the industry part of this. That's been the progression over the past 25 years is getting less and less interested in competing. Um, and in, in sort of being in the industry. And so I'm, tr I'm still trying to sort out who I'm gonna be for whatever life I got left. Um, a when I'm here right now, I think a lot that I'm gonna do something around working with young people that, are, uh, that have gone through some stuff and have a trouble trusting adults and trusting human beings because there are some people that, that help me through a lot. Um, so I, I really, I, I don't know, I just know that we're back to tides. I mean, I just know that my choice right now is I can be scared about getting older and becoming irrelevant. And, you know, all the, I mean, I got a million voices of fear in my head. They don't stop coming. And that's sort of the good news and the bad news for you is that I don't have, I don't think any more certainty about my life than a lot of you are probably feeling right now. And in some ways, maybe I have less even. And that can also be a good feeling because if I can, I don't know if like positive thinking yields positive results. I don't know about all that stuff. I do know, though, that if I'm imagining the future, and the future is a hallucination, why would I have a bad future? Which I do a lot of the time. I imagine things not working out. And imagining a good future is just more fun. It's just more interesting. So I think that's where I'm at. And just to circle back to your social networking thing, it's whatever it is. And this is just, this is a language, it's a generational thing. This is a new medium, mm -hmm. you know. TV, our, our folks said the same thing about TV and their folks said the same thing about something else and their folks, you know, right. so that's all that is. So just whatever the technology is, use it well, lift each other up. We're all we got. We see the hate and fear all around us. You've got the information flying at you. Um, we're going to be gone before you are, odds are, so it's, uh, it's your world. All right. Um, do you want to play us out? You want to do something? Yeah, yeah. I know you all are heading to lunch. First off, thanks for spending time with me. Uh, this means the world to me. Um, keep in touch. Speaking of the, the networks, one thing I do like is that we can talk. So anytime you want to say hi on Instagram or Facebook or through my website, please do. Just like this. I hope it's more of a conversation than a commercial. Um, and uh, yeah, just... I'm going to put you on the spot real quick. Oh, good. So next time you're on the East Coast, would uh, Thomas McCain High School possibly be on your list of places to stop? I will. I will. And it, the more you get to know me, you, the more you know that I will not... Uh, that I will not lie about things like this. Anytime you have me back, I'm here. I'll come to classrooms. I'll, whatever it is. I love this very much. This feels amazing. I feel honored. Um, and it's kind of the first time I've ever really done anything like this. Um, so maybe this is where I'm headed and maybe this was the start of it. So yes, I'm, I'm here any, anytime you'll have me. I'd love to have you. And I'm going to sing you out with a tune called 14 to 41 that I wrote uh, in my mid twenties when I was freaking out about growing up, about being a father. And most of you are just on this, you know, you're just getting into this, this window I'm talking about where you're trying to grow up and innocence is kind of gone and you're trying to figure out how to be cool and all the things that we, we convince ourselves are important. And um, I think the more pressure we put on ourselves, I think my main health risk right now is stress. If I, if I don't deal with my stress, that's what's gonna kill me before anything else. So I recommend to you whatever scars you got Start doing the work now. Tell your stories to each other. Um, yeah, work it out. Find people that you trust and, uh, and talk to them because there's no time too soon. And here's a tune for you. Keep in touch. Thanks forever. 14, 41. Start blind and up, up. You're 16, 23, 32,
Thanks for being here. Thanks for taking your time. So we wanted to give a, a nice Highlander thank you once again. This is Jonah Matranga, Lone Rewinding, 23 years of fatherhood and music. You also have a USB. Oh yeah, uh, for those that don't like reading books, I, li I drive a lot, so I, got an, I made an audio book and I read the whole book, which is a torturous thing, uh, but it was good. I'm glad I did it. Um, so yeah, that's good too. So you can get the USB and there's about 42 or 62 songs? Uh, 65 Six, tunes. 65, yeah. Yeah, that kind, of, that kind of line up the book and there's there's some really heavy stuff. There's some really acoustic -y stuff. Um, for anyone who's asking about hip hop, um, I was on a Lupe Fiasco record a bunch of years back. Um, and there's, uh, there's some, you know, you can find out about that as well. So, yeah. Cool. So, Highlander, thank you to Jonah Matranga, everybody. This wraps up our first classroom series. Thank you, you thank rule. Thank you for being the first. You're lucky. Keep this going. Thank you so much for being our first, buddy. Thanks, buddy. The last time happy I could be. Never gonna find out A house in the burbs and a bitch in a SUV is how I'm never gonna wind up I didn't know Lennon, a king of Kennedy But I know one thing, you gotta know your enemies So keep the laws telling me how happy I could be I'm never gonna find out
summer is over.